Good evening, everybody. Welcome back to Spirits and Ghost Stories. I'm your host, Thomas Ahrens. And I'm Carly Bird. Week 83. Happy Halloween season, Carly. How have you been doing? I've been doing well, Thomas Cranking out the Ahrens. Old pony podcast. I on. have been working hard and um, never, ever leave my office, but that's fine. Everything's fine. Yeah, she never leaves her office. She's now started her new podcast, Pony Playtime. I think we mentioned this last time, last mm-hmm. episode of Spirits and Ghost Stories. And that's kind of taken away from this a little bit, sadly, as she's been getting that up and running. But uh, You make my podcast sound like I'm diddling somebody's fiddle. Aren't you fiddle diddling? What are you doing? I'm not fiddle diddling. Pitch me on it. What are you doing? So what Genevieve and I are doing on Unbridled Talk is talking about horses the equestrian world um how to be the best equestrian how to get involved if you are not already um how to look for and purchase your first pony and then also talking a lot about our favorite sport of mounted games across america so that is called mgaa and um we have already released um about six five five or six podcasts at this point um and we have a lot in the queue and we've been doing probably like three two to three interviews per week lately for the last three-ish weeks and um we've got a lot of really cool people we just had um a published book author come on to talk about um her her life as like a fitness coach that primarily targets equestrians. That's pretty cool. Yeah. To like, That's really cool. Yeah. So anyway, uh, long story short to say it's going well. It's cool. But do not, please, I beg of you, do not Google unrivaled talk because I did the other day and it is not good. So I don't know. I wonder if there was somebody that mentioned this about uh, titling your YouTube channel, how important it is to... So apparently there's already another podcast called Unbridled to Talk. Yes. That exists. Um, we are, Our podcast is not yet on podcast platforms. We're only on Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, and YouTube. And um, apparently Unbridled to Talk that is on the platforms um, is by Sluts of Blackness. Unbridled talk by sluts of blackness. For some reason, that makes me so happy. There are other title they're going to go with is Pony Playtime. No, it was that. not. We were not going <laughs> to. So anyway, the actual podcast called Unbridled Talk is a podcast hosted by Sluts of Blackness, a collective of queer f- themes of color in London, England. So I just I, for some reason, I that makes me so happy that Jenny is. Let's say my my, my sister's also doing this that she's. She puts out like a thousand dollars in advertising, and she just puts that title out there, like "Come check and out my podcast." The only and people everyone they... goes straight to that, like Chris, <laughs> like all of your friends go straight to. That. <laughs> On this episode, we're going to talk to you about BDM and strap-ons. I literally googled it for the first time yesterday, and I was like, "Well, see it." And uh, we've already gotten this far. We can't quite change the name. So it is what it is. So guys, when you do a podcast or a YouTube channel. Please do your history. Like, and you do your research, research. The reason, you know, Spirits and Ghost Stories and, you know, my other channel, Fishing the DMV, I did extensive research into making sure, like, I kind of own that titling. Um, definitely own Fishing the DMV top to bottom. It was very unique. Um, uh, Spirits and Ghost Stories, not as much. It was still unique, but not as much unique. Uh, and then, yeah, so that's that's fantastic. So that's basically our scary thing in the news. Uh, <laughs> that- scary thing in the news is all Carly's hard work. It's just been thrown to the wind. It's fine. So, Everything's fine. But we're getting back into the Halloween theme. We already picked our pumpkin this year. Which we're we gonna be did. Carving. I'm going to oh. have her help me carve it, actually. Last year, we painted them. And this year, I think we're going to actually carve which would be kind of fun right and let me know in the comment section down below how do you guys like to actually carve your pumpkins and then we did our corn maze which i love corn mazes they're just so much fun it's just it it's such a hollow it's, it's just a fall thing to do mm-hmm. and then we have uh, a couple of haunted attractions we're doing this weekend we are going to i keep wanting to say macross haunted forest which by the way guys we are going to go to macross haunted forest most likely next weekend not this pro- coming weekend. if it's still available so i know fun they're fact, sold out it's ho- it's cool because I remember when it was like you could get tickets no problem when I was younger and now it's like it's booked a year in advance. It's so I it's mean nuts. that that shit must be legit 
And I really hope when we pay the prices for it, if we, if we do get to go this year, yeah. this is my one pet peeve with all haunted houses. I really want to get to this tangent before we get to the story because it's just, it drives me crazy. When you pay and then they cram like 600 of you to go together. Yep. And then all of a sudden, like there's no, there's no scare. No. It, it's not creepy at all. No, it's actually boring and annoying because everybody's pushing everybody. And it's just like, yo. And, 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 and they trigger it. They trigger the scare. Yeah. So then it's like, oh, I know that's coming. Yeah. It's terrible. Um, and we'll compare that with a uh, family. Uh, a family friend of ours, or family friend of my wife, um, they do a private haunted house really just for their family. And again, guys, we're like related to Appalachian. So when they say family, it's like 2,000 people. So all the kinfolk. But the point is... It's family and friends, but it is a private event. But it's small. Yes. It's super duper small groups. Yeah. So if you want to go in by yourself, if you want to go with just two people, you can. And I'm telling you, that changes the experience. Um, Shocktober and Leesburg used to be that way, where it was like yeah. the first time we went, oh, man. super small groups. It was so cool. The suspense is good. You don't trigger anything. And then it, and then it hits you. And it's so much better. Yeah. We went to a friend's in um, Ohio for a haunted thing a couple years ago. Uh, shout out to Southern Kayla. And that one was, it was okay. The problem again was too many people. Like one group would like rush from behind you yeah. and blow through it. And yeah. you have to like wait, which is what I wanted to do just so it can reset and everything so it can be scary again. So again, my point is that is something I would suggest pro tip. If you can ask about it, like how big are the group sizes? Mm -hmm. If you can have small group sizes, boom, that's perfect. Right. Um, and then everyone else, and this is another annoying thing. If you're going to put on a haunted house, give it about 10 to 15 minutes, maybe even a little bit longer between shuffling groups in. Mm -hmm. We've done that before at Makarovs in the past where they would shove you in and then five seconds later, they pop the other group out. Right. And all of a sudden, they're blowing right past you. Right. And it just makes it so annoying. But, you know, that's my little thing about when you're going to haunted houses is just try to make sure that. And sometimes the smaller ones are better. Last thing we found last year, one in Percival, I think, or in Hillsboro. I think it was last year, right, that we found that one? In yes. Just oh, this, my this gosh. One. Yeah. That, I think that was like the only one we got to go to last year. Um, But it was real. No, we did your we did your family's one, too. That's true. That's true. But that one was really good. Again, small group. Just us. It we, was. Oh, my gosh. And it was creepy. It was I think creepy. we talked about it on the show, actually, how yeah. creepy it was because we were like one of the only people there. It was just really interesting. We got there and we were like, what's going on? It was kind of rainy that night, so it was not the perfect night for it. But it was still going on. You know what I mean? And I think that's why it was so quiet quiet and slow but that made it like even more ugh, like why are we the only ones here why is this so like uh, such a secluded mm. little haunted place are we actually going to get murdered what's going on super awesome so guys let, let us know that in the comment section below you know what's your favorite type of haunted house what's your favorite type of scary movie to do next co episode we're going to do kind of a our favorite scary movies i thought we could do that that'd be kind of fun yes. for next week so we'll do top three top five but anyway we're gonna be looking forward to that anyway we're gonna get to today's story and today we're going to a throwback to basically what i think makes our channel famous which is appalachia appalachian folklore and witchcraft yes and so as always with these bigger episodes i'm going to give a little bit of backstory before miss bird tells the tale and so weirdly the history of appalachia is really interesting and so before we kind of get into the lore behind it, I want to kind of give a little bit of the history of Appalachia. So what is considered Appalachia? The current boundary of Appalachian region includes all of West Virginia and parts of 12 other states, Alabama, Georgia, Kentucky, Maryland, Mississippi, New York, North Carolina, Ohio, Pennsylvania, South Carolina, Tennessee, and Virginia. It covers over 200, 205 thousand square miles 420 counties and is home to more than 25 million americans 42 percent of the region's population is rural is rural compared with 20 percent of the nation which is insane and this place is extremely isolated by 1932 and i got this from west virginia pa the history of west virginia power um, by 1932 only about 10 percent of rural america was electrified so by 1932, we're getting into World War II here with, with aircraft carriers and planes, and then only 10% of America, of rural America, was actually had electricity. Mm -hmm. And then go into the backwoods of Appalachia, that's probably even less so. Mm -hmm. It's a very isolated, mountainous place. And then the history of Appalachia is integral to and woven into the traditions of Appalachian Granny Witchcraft. Integral. Integral. Although the name Granny Witchcraft is relatively recent, the customs and practice practices it encompass have an ancient root forming a unique blend of folk magic faith healing and superstition 
This tradition played a vital role in the lives of people living in the remote, isolated region of Appalachia. As European settlers arrived in the Appalachian colonies during the 18th century, they bought, they brought with them their in, 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 indigenous folk magic and healing modalities from Scotland, England, Ireland. This paper explores all of that information. Now let's kind of get into like what blend, what, what makes us different. Appalachian granny, granny witchcraft emerged as a result of cultural interactions between Europe settlers, indigenous communities, including Native Americans, German immigrant, immigrants, and people of African descent. And what's interesting about this, as we've talked about before on the show, and we'll just give a quick little recap there, the Celts and the Celtic mythology, which is German, Irish, um, Welsh, British, mm. They're huge in the folklore that we know today. Dragons. Uh, they were really big in pushing the dragon myth. Uh, the Kapaushka. Mm -hmm. um, the, Kel the water Kelpie. That is huge. Um, when you say the Kapaushka, I actually think that that is the word used for that book only that I specifically read when I was working in that middle school. I mm -hmm. found this book about the water Kelpies. But the name, the fake name was Kapaushka. So every time you say Kapaushka, nobody knows what you're talking about. So, yeah, so it's, it's not it's, a real it's, word. It's a water Kelpie. Um, <laughs> but they're really big at folklore and telling tales. Fairies. You know, all that stuff came from that kind of background. Mm -hmm. Now you're taking these people, this this descendant of, of being able to, of taking that, that tradition of telling stories, that tradition of myths, and you're bringing them over into Appalachia where they're completely isolated, generally speaking, because people in Appalachia, again, like, like we mentioned earlier, isolated communities, over time, you develop your own culture again, it mixes, and you develop brand new tales, mm -hmm. which again, fascinating to me. Um, and so we get really into like the religious influence here in the religious landscape of Appalachia where Protestant, where Pro Protestantism prevailed, many who pr pr practiced granny magic would have admittedly been denied any association with witchcraft due to the re religious fervor of the time. Mm -hmm. So you have a bunch of upstart Protestants, mm -hmm. you have granny over there and she's using some tobacco to fix things mm -hmm. guess what oh that's a she's a witch she's a devil and then what happened in the salem witch trials a lot of the same thing it's just this superstition aspect of, of the christianity fervor that creates all of these issues and, and and the one thing i want to touch on here before we kind of get in into the story today is because of that isolationism you didn't have the ability to go get hospitals or medicine mm -hmm. and so i think granny magic also kind of blends that tradition as well of faith healing um, using herbs and nowadays you could almost be called like being a nat uh, what's it called like uh, um not is it homeopathic yeah homeopathic mm -hmm. ways of healing and that sounds so funny to me that back then if they're doing stuff homeopathically to help you and then they were like yep yeah, that's a witch it's like holistic or yeah. something why aren't you just using leeches and stuff i know and that's probably part of what made this happen right. appalachian granny Appalachian granny witchcraft has its roots in ancient Scottish traditions brought to the religion as early as the 16th century. Over time, these traditions evolved into something distinctively Appalachian, distinctively American. The granny witchcraft that we noted today of the Appalachian mountains spent centuries cultivating and growing into what we know it is today. In conclusion, Appalachian granny witchcraft is an integral part of the history and the culture of the Appalachian region, which has evolved over the centuries. So that's just a little quick snippet of kind of the Appalachian culture, how that has grown up in this very isolated part. And guys, again, like if you're not from this area, it is very remote. Some of these places you can get back into the Smoky Mountains, things like that. And so we're going to get into some more cryptids and things like that later on as well. Because there are so many cryptids. Uh, one of our one of our listeners, Scott Barnes, I believe your name is. And my apologies if I got that wrong. Send us this really cool list, which we'll show next episode, about all the different creatures that are of Appalachian folklore myth. One of the biggest ones is Mothman, and, and that's just so fascinating to me how this whole area got this culture. That's too cool. But anyway, I digress. Carly, what is our story? Our story. Okay, it aligns along with our witchy talk and i will do my best not to be offensive considering we are talking about the appellation and uh i will curb my tongue also i did want to give you a brief little good job pat on the back that's probably one of the best things you've ever read 
for the entire show and we are on episode 83 so i did it everyone prepare yourselves for the witch of arlena falls There is an unexpected turn in the weather this morning, says our local meteorologist. Instead of seeing a warm day, we are getting a snowstorm that sources are saying could turn into the storm of the century. Dad turned off the radio, grumpy as hell this morning. It's always the storm of the century with these guys, he muttered, tapping his fingers on the worn steering wheel. His wedding ring clicked against the aged leather. I looked away from it before I could start thinking about mom. We got along fine, dad and me, even with mom gone. Drives like this going to school before anyone else got there was my favorite. It was a quiet time we shared before the cancer finally took her. And even though at home we felt her absence like a goddamn cavern swallowing us whole, here in this old pickup, things were fine. Things were okay. He had worked over at the factory, always did, so I always got dropped off to school hours before anyone got there. Teachers got used to seeing me there by myself, doing homework, reading a book, or since my parents scrounged up enough to get my cell phone, playing games that didn't eat up any of my precious data. Today was no different. The parking lots were empty when we pulled up to the school. I appreciated my silence. It was a good time to think. Call me pretentious, but I don't think enough people spend time thinking on their own and enough time to process. When I opened the truck door, it was a biting, awful cold, cutting straight through the jacket I had on. Dad took off his scarf and tossed it over me. I was too cold, too, I was too old now to, cl to close, I was too old now, too close to being a man for him to wrap me up in the way he used to. Also, we're a boy. I guess we're a guy. I pictured myself as a girl this whole time. <laughs> My bad. I looked up into the sky, dark clouds rolling in like tidal waves, and saw the flecks of snow beginning to fall. Dad grunted and started up the truck again, sputtering to life, the only thing in the empty parking lot. Looks like it'll be a rough day today, son. Try to stay warm. It was sixth period English when we got the announcement, flickering over the intercom. Miss Mellis stopped her lecture on Lord of the Flies to listen. Due to the amount of snowfall, we are going to stay on campus until the snowplows can reach this side of town. The principal droned, your parents have been informed that you will be with us until you could safely be picked up. The process for being checked out by your parents will be gone over by your sixth period teacher, where you will stay until we are able to safely release you. Yes, Brian Donovan practically shouted in my ear. I had a chem test after school. There is a god after all. Settle down, Mr. Donovan, Miss Mills warned, even though she was looking at him sitting behind me. I flushed under her gaze. When she saw me turn red, she smiled slightly. I didn't know why I bothered looking away. My giant crush was obvious and was probably flattering to her. Miss Mills was probably in her mid-thirties, real pretty, unmarried for some reason. Everyone said she was a lesbian. <laughs> she <laughs> sighed, turning on the projector. Well, I can't imagine getting any work done with you all knowing we have a snow day ahead. Go ahead and stop hiding your cell phones from under your desks and behind books. We all know you have them. You can use them until we figure out what's going on. Everyone laughed and cheered, putting away their books and binders. Some people didn't play on their phones, just talked about how great it was to get some time off to relax. There was half an hour left in class, and she basically let us go. It was awesome. I got dragged into some conversation I paid no attention to, instead glancing around the room and thinking about my classmates. Arlette? The cheer captain, who was beautiful and pleasant and smart, the kind of unfair sort of graces that God gives out sometimes. Then the most unfair of his doings, Delilah, who was an ema em emaciated sort of thin, with hair that stays greasy even after a good washing, doodling away in her sketchbook. Usually from, usually from some anime, sharpied finger fingernails scratching at the pinned stars on the backs of her hands. Herman, who was in the ma marching band and would never shut up about it, 
Nick, also in band and deeply ashamed of it. <laughs> Chuck, redheaded and obsessed with her books and stories. Some people whose names I still don't know and can't remember. So unremarkable to the world. Brian was probably my best friend. He was popular, and I guess I was too, by association. Brian ran track, and I watched. He dated cheerleaders, and I hung out in front of the gas stations with them, sipping on a Slurpee while they made out. He was a pal, and the most annoying human being on the planet. He smacked me in the back of the head as if he read my mind, offended. You paying attention to me at all, Davy? Nope, I said, shoving him off me. A group of girls sitting around us laughed. The lights above us flickered, stopping all the conversation in the room. It's been an hour or so after the end of school. The outside world was wrapped up in darkness and snow, the light gone. Even though the sunset wasn't for another few hours, everyone was unnerved by the sudden quiet. Delilah looked up from her sketches for a moment, then looked back down, apparently undisturbed by the quiet disruption. Spooky. Miss Mellis deadpanned, rolling her eyes, after people chuckled, easing some of the tension. What, you pussycats afraid of being in a few flickering lights, she smiled. I always liked her. Even when I was a kid, before my brother graduated, she was his teacher. She was always nice to me, calling me cute when I was seven. Guess that's all it really took. We're not supposed to be here this late, you know. Chuck said in a hushed voice. Everyone turned to look at her. Nobody's supposed to be here after hours. Why not? Brian asked, obnoxious as ever. Because of the witch, dumbass, she snapped. The one who lives in our school. Brian paused for a second. That's the dumbest fucking thing I've ever heard. Language, Mr. Donovan. He's right, though, Arlette interjected. What do you mean, a witch that lives in our school. That's insane. Chuck shook her head. No, really, it's true. I read it in the library once about the history of this school. It used to be an unholy place that witches worshipped and practiced dark magic. They used to perform sacrifices right here where the school is today. I suppose if you want to tell scary stories to pass the time, I'm fine with that, Miss Mellis said, checking her watch. I'm going to see what's going on with the other teachers. The phones aren't working, probably because it's after hours. I'll let you know what's going on in a bit. She left the classroom, leaving the door slightly ajar in case something happens. Everyone automatically moved their chairs in a circle to listen to Chuck. She was a weirdo, but always told the best stories. With our phones running low on power from playing on them for the past few hours, it was the closest thing to entertainment we could get. The only person who didn't scoot over was Delilah, still drawing away. It was creepy. She was creepy. The lights flickered overhead again, and Arlette drew closer to me. Brian wagged his eyebrows at me, and I threw an eraser at his head. Chuck cleared her throat. <clears throat> I found it in the very back of the library when I was a freshman, tucked away on the shelf like nobody wanted me to find it. My page jumped. I found it. It was about the history of the school and the land before it was built. It was old and falling apart. Like if I sneezed, the whole thing would fall apart into dust. I was really careful when I started reading it. It turns out that there was a colony here back in the 1700s. It was quiet and good, all God-fearing people. And they prayed every day that the winter would be kind and that the snow would not come. But it came every year, wiping out crops, killing livestock, and oftentimes taking the lives of the colonists. Still, they prayed. After years of things happening, and the town elders started to wonder why this was happening, even after they prayed to their god. Because they touched themselves at night, Brian snickered. Arlette gave him a dirty look, and he stopped. They realized that it was because of a witch. She lived in the town, a young lady that suddenly realized had always been there, even as generations passed. Nobody realized maybe because she cast a spell on them. Boo! Cast a spell, my ass! Brian, shut up! That she never aged and stayed exactly the same. 
year after year after year. It turns out that it was her the whole time and the sacrifices the snow brought her kept her useful. After all this time, when the town elders discovered this, they vowed to get their revenge. The lights dimmed, then glowed brightly again. Arlette grabbed my arm, squeezing tight. They found her in the cottage all alone, facing the corner with their head up, chanting her spells in a choked scream. The snow had already begun falling, and the elders grabbed her and dragged her out into the town center. She was still chanting, eyes rolled up into the back of her head. The town chief ordered a fire to be built so they could burn the witch. They couldn't get it kindled with the snow falling so thickly, he tried to tie her hands together, but it was so cold that his fingers could not cooperate. So instead, he took the blacksmith's hammer and nailed her hands to the handing post. There was no blood. There was never any blood. Witches don't bleed. He ripped out her tongue so that he could stop the snowfall and save his town, but she continued to scream. He slit her throat, and whatever breath was left in her body exhaled the last of her spell. And the town was blanketed in white, lost until it thawed that spring. New settlers found the entire town melted out and gone rotten in the sun. But they never found the witch. The nails were there in the hanging post, but she was gone. I didn't realize I was digging my nails into my palm until the pain slowed. Like a realization, I let go and shook my hands, deep indents in my skin. Arlette did not let go of me. So the new settlers built Arlena Falls here. And Arlena Falls High School. Every year, we get major snowfall as the witch tries to find her next sacrifice. Kids kept disappearing or getting into fatal accidents as the years went by, which is why we're not allowed to stay here late at night. Nuh-uh, Herman pro protested. The marching bands stays here late every day and you don't see us being sacrificed. And the band nerds are prime candidates for virgin sacrifices, Brian yelled. I sucked him in the arm. He was my best friend and definitely the most annoying person in the world. The music building is brand new. Built like five years ago, Chuck countered. So it isn't the same. It was eerie now that I thought about it. We weren't allowed to stay late. Campus security and teachers made sure of it, sweeping anyone trying to stay behind. Any nighttime PTA meetings were up to be held at City Hall. They said it was because classrooms were too small to hold all the parents. But why not use the gym? I stopped myself. This was just another one of Chuck's stories. It was just a way to pass the time. I looked at the clock on the wall. It was nearing 5 o'clock. Dad was getting out of work soon. I wondered where he was going or if he even got the message from the school. I wondered if he knew what was happening at Arlena Falls High School. 6.52 p.m. We were getting snappish with one another fast. Brian was getting on my last nerve. My alone time was precious and it was being eaten up by his loud mouth. So, Chuck, how do we tell if the witch is with us or not? Does she fly in on a broomstick or what? There was a sigh. <laughs> there are signs, idiot. She snapped from her desk. She was looking more and more worried as the minutes ticked by. It seemed like after her story, everyone was more than a little freaked out. Arlette moved her stuff next to me. I should have felt some sort of manly pride at being the one she felt safe around, but I was mostly just uneasy and on edge like everyone else. The outside world was barely visible from our second story window, gusts of wind occasionally shaking the glass in its frame and making us jump. It sounded like someone was tapping on the window, lining the walls. And we kept saying out loud, as if it made it all better for everyone else. Stupid wind. Stupid snow. Arlette's stomach grumbled loudly, and she swore under her breath. I wish I had something to offer her, but everyone had already chowed down on whatever snacks they had in their backpacks after school. We didn't even have sticks of gum to split between us. Arlette raised her hand to ask if we could go raid the cafeteria or something. Even the good student then paused. Wait, where's Miss Milas? Sure enough, our teacher had disappeared. She went to check on the other teachers and never came back. That was hours ago. A cold shiver ran down my spine. I looked around my classmates. I felt their 
conscious rise. The already uneasiness of the room shifted into something else. Panic. Nobody panic, Arlette instructed us, but I could see in the tremor of her hand. She was just as scared as the rest of us. I'm sure she's just chatting with the other teachers and lost track of time. It's been hours, said Nick quietly. Everyone turned to look at him. He rarely said much. There's no way she just forgot about us, he paused, scratching at himself nervously. There's just no way. At that point, the power went out and something banged against the windows. Everyone screamed. Some running from for the door and tripping over backpacks strewn into the ground. Just as quickly, the lights flickered back on. The backup generator picking up speed. Kids were on the floor, rubbing their bruised knees. Some were crying, freaked out as hell. Brian stood up from where he knelt, gripping the desk as he was bracing for impact. He looked at me and nodded. Dave and I will go check out the other classrooms and see where Miss Milas went. Oh, fuck me. I knew there was a reason he was my best friend, but also, fuck him. I didn't want to leave the classroom, but he was already heading out, so I followed him. It's what I did. I picked up the fire extinguisher. We had a school shooter rally early in the semester where some expert told us that a fire extinguisher made a great weapon. I didn't know I would ever have to think about that again. As we stepped out of the classroom... Into the empty hallway, I heard Herman say, wasn't she supposed to tell us how our parents are supposed to pick us up? It was true. I was suddenly filled with dread. What happened to Miss Milas? Was she okay? Brian led the way. Our classroom was older, a little ways from the other classrooms. So when we got to the first one, we had to build up enough adrenaline from the silent anxiety to bust some heads open. <laughs> Brian knocked, then, the op then the opened the door. It was empty. Isn't this Coach Langdon's room? He whispered. He taught six period geometry before coaching baseball. Why wouldn't he be here? It was amazing. The kinds of things we rationalize. They probably release students in waves, I said, hearing the franticness of my voice. I couldn't shake it, no matter how hard I tried. And we're on and we're one of the last since we're so far. But we should be getting back, man. What if the class gets released and we get left behind? I'm gonna go check a few more classrooms. He motioned for me to hand him the fi he motioned for me to hand him the fire extinguisher, and I tossed it to him. I'll head back to Miss Mila's room. I promise I'll come back and find you if when she comes back. I felt like a goddamn pussy, but being in that empty hallway, staring at that empty classroom this late after school was terrifying. I had to get back. Brian went on steadily, and I tried not to run back to the classroom. 7.12 p.m. They're all empty. Brian's set the fire extinguisher neck to him with a clunk. He looked pale as a ghost. They're all gone. The teacher's lounge is empty, too. Miss Milas is gone. But how could she leave us? Arlette stammered. She's our teacher. Come on, I insisted. She didn't leave us. Shut up, man, with your stupid fucking hard on for that dyke. Brian practically exploded. She fucking left us. She couldn't have. She probably went to go get help or something. It was so flimsy that I even knew what I was saying was stupid. All eyes were on me. She wouldn't have just left us like that, not willingly. Not willingly, Chuck repeated. Her eyes got huge, like saucers. Not willingly? She burst into tears. Everyone stared at her. It was just a story, she started crying hard. It was just a story. What was just a story, Herman yelled, terror in his voice. The witch thing? Chuck just cried harder, rubbing her mascara all over her cheeks. I didn't think it was real. It couldn't have been. But the signs. What are the signs? First the snow, she sobbed, hiccuping like she was choking. Then everyone leaves, just disappears. Then what? The lights flickering again. The lights flickered again and everyone screamed. They drove for they dove for one another, trying to grip onto something. Arlette was no longer grabbing my arm. She was glued to her seat in terror, tears streaming down her face. The witch will appear as one of us. A deadly silence fell over the room. The kind of silence only a snowstorm can bring. Oppressive. 
and applying something terrible. Brian swallowed audibly. How, how do we know who the witch is? This is stupid, I tried. We're just freaking out. There is no witch. Chuck said it was just a story she made up. No, I read it. The book is in the library. She continued to weep. I found it when Miss Milis assigned Lord of the Flies. It was right there in the back. How do we know? Brian shouted, commanding the room. I fell silent, watching him place around the room, pace around the room like an animal. Come on, Chuck, how do we know? When she kept crying, we walked up to her and grabbed her shoulder, shaking her hard enough for us to hear her teeth click together. Chuck! She's quiet, not the first person we'd think of. Quiet, not the first person we'd think of. So we all thought of the same person. We turned to the corner of the classroom where Delilah stood. She was thin, practically swimming in that giant black hoodie of hers. She was always quiet, hidden away in the background. It turns out it was her the whole time. She just stood there, petrified, staring at us. What? What? She couldn't even finish her sentence. She raised her hands as if to protect herself. In the center of her palms, dark circles, stigmate, like she was nailed to a post by her hands. The generator failed and the lights went out. A gust of wind finally defeated the old windows, shattering it and sending snow and broken glass bits around the room. It was chaos. Brian picked up the fire extinguisher and started making his way to Delilah, who was frozen in fear and babbling incoherently. Ink, she kept screeching. It's just pen. It's just ink. He moved with such a force. I could only think of one thing. I tackled him from behind. Brian, wait. He elbowed me right in the nose and blood gushed down my mouth, down my shirt. I gasped for breath, seeing stars falling back. Delilah ran for the door. The lights turned on and off. Generator picking up speed and dying. Coughing up life and death. Everyone chased after her. Picking up yardsticks or pencils or pins. Hollering and yelling. Sounding like war cries. Arlet helped me up and we ran after them. I was so dizzy. Woozy. I heard Delilah screaming and crying for help as she pounded down the stairs, everyone running after her. The doors at the front of the school burst open and she collapsed into a snow pile, running for her life. But everyone was so much faster. Everyone was just so much faster. 9.21 p.m. When the ambulance and fire trucks and police finally arrived, we were half frozen to death. They asked even later on why we didn't just go back inside. They didn't understand. We couldn't. We couldn't go back inside. The blood inside the school mixed in with the fresh snow like a drop. Coke slurpy. Browning in the bitterly cold air. The paramedics did their best to scrape up what they could take back with them. The police stood around shocked and unsure what to do. This kind of thing just didn't happen in Arlena Falls. They led Brian away, who was silent, flecked with blood and bits. Chuck kept whispering, Witches don't bleed. Witches don't bleed. We were all taken to the police station and then released to our parents. Dad didn't say a word about my banged up nose or my black eye or my choked crying all the way home. I thought about mom, the emptiness that she'd left behind. I thought I was going to die right there in the mudroom of our home gasping for breath. Dad held me like I was a kid again. It didn't make anything right. Accident at Arlena Falls High School leads to fatality by Selena Lamb. When the storm of the century hit Arlena Falls, a greater tragedy occurred when a student, Delilah Chapman, was killed in an accident in the school's courtyard. Sources say that the student in question was well-liked by her classmates and was considered a good friend. They say the straight-A student was quiet and never caused any trouble, and was a valued member of the high school population. The accident occurred when the students were left behind when the school lifted their snow day lockdown. In a strange occurrence, students did not check their cell phones to see the lockdown was finished and that they were free to go. School officials say that the teacher of the students left behind, Miss Helena Miles, is currently on paid administration leave while the district investigates.
Miss Milas has been a member of the school's faculty for 37 years. Follow, flowers and condolences have been sent to surviving members of the Chapman family, her parents, John and Silva, at 4237 Rockwell Drive. For more information, subscribe to the Arlena Falls Gazette. And that was the tale of the witch at Arlena Falls. One thing I like about doing this show, and you do all these episodes, some of them are a pain in the ass to get to, and then I keep thinking of, like, Mr. Stick Lakes was the one, the last one, really, where it's like, holy crap, this should be, like, a TV show or a movie. It could be a mini, a, like, a mini movie. That one, like, oof. Damn. I got nothing. Let's end it there, then. We'll see you guys next time on Spirits and Ghost Stories. Thanks. Bye. Bye.